And the key is to be able to sit down and talk to people who, you know, have a lot in common and have a lot of differences and find the common ground, you know. And just because somebody disagrees with you does not make them evil or the enemy. Welcome to this episode of Adler.tv, where there's a new episode and a new guest in a new location every single week. My guest today is John Archibald. He just won the Pulitzer Prize. He's also studying to become a blacksmith. So John Archibald decided he wanted to meet me at Sloss Furnaces. It's a national historic landmark that originally dates back to 1881 and now has a museum that's free to visit. While the furnaces helped put Birmingham on the map with its iron production, many people lost their lives over the years working at Sloss Furnaces and many of those workers were forced or debt bondage laborers. Now with its new functionality as a museum of industry with events, metal arts, and educational programs, Sloss Furnaces is a symbol of Birmingham's industrial past and hopefully bright future. Sorry about the train noises in the background, but Sloss Furnaces was a perfect place for a podcast with John Archibald. He's been so kind to be my guest today. He reports with his own brand of pessimistic optimism. Ladies and gentlemen, John Archibald. Thanks, man. Thanks. I call it skepticism. Skepticism. And indignation. That's right. That's, right. that's the fuel. Um, we're here at Sloss Furnace because you have been taking blacksmith lessons. You're a blacksmith. Well, well, I would, man, I, I guess a real blacksmith would probably disagree with that, but I've been obsessed with banging on metal for the last couple of years and I did, took a couple of classes up here and um, and have just been, you know, turning junk into junk is what I do. So uh, I'm not great at it, but it sure is a lot of fun. That's a fun hobby. You you said you even have a setup at your house. Oh, uh, yeah. You would be surprised how much an anvil costs, by the way. I, I probably would. How much is an anvil? Well, they go for like $10 a pound. And so, uh, like some of the ones they use over there, 300 pound anvil are gonna cost you $3,000. It's, oh like, it's like buying a car. I had no idea. So, oh, not at all, not at all. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Somebody just walked in. We are at Sloss Furnaces, uh, what is called the what percolator room not the percolator. pyro uh the pyro uh pyrometer pyrometer room which became known somehow or other as the love shack which is as the love shack so here i am sitting next to a pulitzer prize winner in what is called the love shack on so, a dirty couch on a dirty couch in what is called the love shack there you go in the old pyrometer room <laughs> life is crazy isn't it yeah let's talk about the pulitzer prize you, you won a Pulitzer, and it, it, that will rock uh, not only your life, but also like the, the media company that you work for, Alabama Media Group. It's a big win for everybody. I was really touched uh, and, and impressed and happy to see there's a room full of people that were also winning that award with you. Um, Michelle... Uh, she, she, that picture of her, and she's kind of the VP, mm -hmm. and she, you could just tell, she was just overjoyed for you, and that, and that, that touched my heart, man, that was, that was really neat seeing that. You were celebrating with your son, your son, who also is he a- He does, he works with me, yeah, it's amazing. That's the best part of it, is that he was there. I mean, the whole thing was incredibly, I mean, surreal, in that, you know, it is a rare thing, and you had your stars have to align just right, and it's, every contest is a, just a- ridiculous crap shoot that you know is uh arbitrary as it can be and i understand all that um so i appreciate it too and the fact that you know people were you know people who hate my guts were nice to me about it you know, so, <laughs> and, but you know so i mean it's been fun and it's remarkable how much pressure it kind of makes me feel like i'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to prove it wasn't a huge mistake but uh, but it's been a heck of a year Let me give a little bit of background of, of what I know about you and, and how um, I met you. I guess it was almost more than 10 years ago. I was running the studio board or the sound board uh, for an FM nighttime radio show that former MTV, original MTV VJ, Alan Hunter, was hosting uh, at the time in Birmingham. And I'm running the board, running the mics and all that stuff. And... One of the nights, uh, Alan brought in this guy. He's wearing glasses. He's real soft-spoken. 
And he's <laughs> choosing, and I remember thinking, I'm like, I don't know who this guy is, but everyone in the room is listening to him, and he's choosing his words so carefully. That is a characteristic I definitely need to work on, but I, I just told you that story, and you s said that you you don't feel like you do that. You don't feel like you choose your words. No, I feel like you wind me up, and I open my mouth, and stuff comes out, and <laughs> sometimes I want to claim it, and sometimes I don't. You've been doing journalism for 32 years. Mm -hmm. um, in that amount of time, journalism has completely fundamentally changed from it's we're, it's like we've gone from, you know, horse and buggy to Tesla's in that amount of time when it comes to how people consume news and you have stuck with it and you've been successful in every iteration of that evolution of journalism. And that is that's amazing. So, you know, it's, it's such a roller coaster, right? and it's so interesting for me because I, more than anybody, uh, you know, sort of mourn the way things were when the sense when we were at City Hall all the time covering every little bit of detail, detail or, you know, great story at the library board, something like that, which just frankly doesn't happen today because there aren't enough reporters to do it and readers aren't that interested in it. I mean, uh, in a mass scale, which is what we're deciding is 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 news now it's what people on a mass scale want which is wrong right which is terrible for a community and care terrible for people who watch dogs over local government and all that but at the same time you know there's also a realization now that we understand what people want what people read in ways we never understood before and so if you can kind of keep your foot in one in the old world one foot in the old world and one foot in the new where you are really trying to engage people where they live which is video audio like podcasts uh and in stories that affect people i mean that's you know, the magic potion, I guess, you know, it's so I, I feel sort of guilty because in a sense, you know, a lot of my friends got laid off when, mm -hmm. the, in the, you know, 2011, when the, when everything changed where in, within our company and a lot of other companies, but, uh, and I hated the way we did a lot of things in terms of all that. But if it hadn't happened, I never would have won that prize. I never would have had the attention because I'm focused on broader issues that have more relevance to people beyond here. Uh, and I may be doing that at a, at a uh, you know, at the cost of people who depended on me to write about City Hall and things like that. Right. So, so I always have that conflict. So and I know you know this and I know you've thought about this and um, you you don't do this, but it pays off so amazingly in the short run to run clickbaity headlines and clickbaity articles and clickbaity videos because to me clickbait is I got arrested you know and there's a picture of you in handcuffs and then you find out that it was a, a person dressed up as a police officer like that that's it's a misleading title to right. make people click it when there's something on there that it doesn't it doesn't back up the headline and it gives you something else that, that right. doesn't live up to what you claim it is and it it, it plays and it's stupid bullshit yeah yeah <laughs> It really is. It pays off in the short run, but then people don't trust you anymore. And but but there's got to be that pressure because clicks are revenue, and revenue you have to have. You've seen that with all the layoffs. You know, I mean, how do you how do you avoid that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a huge question. And it, first of all, I would say this is going to be a complicated, long answer. So I may go in the direction we want or may not. But you know, I think that first of all, when people talk about clicks and all that, um, it would be a. Uh, uh, sort of a misrepresentation to say we didn't want to be read in the first place. I mean, back in the day when I was writing for the newspaper, I always wanted to be read. So it's not a matter of wanting clicks because what is a click but somebody to read your stuff. So I always wrote in a way that I thought that people, that I wanted people to read my stuff. That being said, that's different from misrepresenting what your story's about in a headline. But we are now in this wild, wild west of media where everybody's trying to, where there aren't really any rules and where everybody's trying to figure out how to survive. And that whole first era, first iteration of this whole digital first idea was, was really a lot about clicks because you were going to get, make tons of money from ads from, from, from sheer traffic, which doesn't really work. Um, and so there, it, there's really sort of a lessening of that now, sort of an understanding that that doesn't work, at least within the realm I'm in. And so what we've done now where I am is we have different groups, some of which are doing those stories to get the most views, as I would prefer to call it. 
uh, which, you know, the drunkest city in Alabama or whatever it is. Sure, I mean, you sure. know, we really, I mean, I can't, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't care, but I, I'm probably going to click on it just to see. But there are other people who are, we do it through our Reckon brand, which, which don't, don't have, say, page view goals or any of that sort of thing, who are trying to do uh, more depth or analysis or, or that sort of thing. So, I mean, there's got to be an understanding that some, some things work for volume to pay for some things that don't. And, uh, and hopefully in the future we'll find some happy medium where where it all works. Plus people have a much greater understanding of clickbait and how to avoid it. Yeah, I remember when um the onion kind of gained popularity and started <laughs> gaining shares, people would share something and say, Can you believe this? Right. And that that is and after sharing a few things and looking stupid on your Facebook page. People are starting to uh, not do that as more, as much, and and hopefully they're starting to look at the source more. Right. I mean, the whole basic. I mean, the, the the origin of fake news, you know, as as we, it, which become part of the culture now. But uh, I mean, I, I I'm very confident that young people who grew up with the internet are going to be way more savvy about it than. Uh, those of us who were alive before there was an internet. And, uh, you know, studies have shown that old people or older people, people my age and older, are a lot more likely to share that stuff than younger people now. And just think about kids who come up, uh, uh, who are growing up now in the YouTube generation and who, who they're going to have a sense about this that we can only imagine. Yeah, I've got a a, a nephew who, when he was two, could work an iPhone and an iPad very well, and and that's just going to get even crazier and crazier from here. Yeah, I mean, to think we had to take when I grew up when I was coming along and got to college, we had to take typing classes. You know, no kid is ever going to have to take typing classes again. I mean, you know, and the whole uh, the the lengths we went to to do the things kids are able to do in a second now. I mean, it's just uh, it's just part of the it's part of life. I mean, we, we, they just they're just so much more equipped. Yeah, this computer that we all walk around with in our hands, in our pockets, uh, is much more powerful than the home computer I had. Actually, it's more powerful than the, my first laptop I had in college. It's more um, powerful than the computer that put a man on the moon. There it is. There yeah. it is. There are two theories that come up a good bit with Trump. And there is the where there's smoke and this I'm talking about the investigation, uh, the Mueller investigation where there's smoke, there's fire. There's that. There's so much smoke. There's there's so much smoke. There's got to be a fire. And they're just working their way to the dumpster fire. That is the Trump administration. There's that theory. And then there's the theory that if they had something on Trump, they would have come out with it by now. And so they're kind of just dragging this thing along uh, and he's going to make it through this term and the next i would say yeah i mean before i comment on this i will say that my area of expertise that is not my area of expertise and i know about as much of that as anybody who reads the news but my own where i come from is that i do think that uh anytime there's that much fire should be investigated transparently and openly like it would anybody else and uh and people want to make that political but i i think you know i i would like to see I mean, I, I mean, you can look at my work involving any poli any politician anywhere, and I want to see the investigations continue. I mean, I think that we, as the as a people, politicians, leaders, owe us transparency, openness, and a higher standard. Uh, and if they don't give us that, uh, then it is a it is an, a direct affront to us and to the republic. And so, I think that if you choose to be in office. Uh, you uh, are basically signing a waiver saying, OK, let's have it. You're, you're definitely statewide in your in your articles, in your coverage and and bigger than that either. Your scope is, is much larger than that, too. But somehow with so much of your reporting on Alabama alone, it's time and time again is national news. How does Alabama 
it's little old Alabama keep finding itself in the national spotlight time over and over and over again. From the civil rights to the Ten Commandments in the courtroom, from Larry Langford to Siegelman to Governor Bentley to Roy Moore versus Doug Jones. There's recently the terrible events at the Galleria Mall. Um, time and time again, how, how does Alabama manage to do that over and over again? Uh, that is a, that's a great question, man. I mean, you know, I mean, we've had so many and you corrupt public officials going back for decades and you know both parties uh have, have come along and it's been one after the other and most recently of course we had the speaker of the house convicted and the governor kicked out of office and the uh you know and roy, and roy moore getting kicked out of office a couple of times and so you know uh, there's all that um that that fed into the whole political world um but part of it i mean it's just it's a mystery to me um, I mean, obviously for me, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Larry Langford was sure the gift that kept on giving. <laughs> that's, you know, it's part of the, it's part of the color and beauty of Alabama. I mean, cause you know, <laughs> you can say a lot about this place, but it is a, an interesting place to live. I mean, I, and I love this place with all of my heart and I have this, but I'm also torn apart by it because I, I think that it, it shoots itself in the foot all the time that we end up, you know, I, I, you can find somebody on the street, no matter what they look like, and they will give you the shirt off their back. They'll help you probably if, you, if your car breaks down and all of a sudden we divide into our little groups of whatever it is we believe in. We become these sort of mobs that hate each other all of a sudden. And if you meet each other on the street, you, you'll slap each other on the back. But if you meet each other on the Internet, you'll punch each other in the face. So, I mean, I, I just it's like this dichotomy I don't quite fully get. I think that um, with the Internet, there's that barrier. You don't like you said, you're, you're not seeing that person face to face. So you're doing things, you're saying things that you would never do. It's like people that suffer from road rage would never scream in a person's face to the level that they scream in their car on their own because they know they have that barrier between them and that other person. And so I think the Internet in a lot of ways um, has fueled this the politicizing of everything it's easy to get mad about politics it's easy to say all right i think this i'm going to stick to this and i'm going to hate anybody at least on the internet that doesn't feel the same way you, you mentioned larry langford you he who recently passed away your article about his passing i thought showed it showed who you are and and in, in a great way you the title was he's Larry Langford had feet of clay, but he had his head in the in the clouds or anyways, it, that that would have been for a lot of people. Another another chance to say good riddance for a lot of people. That would be kind of the attitude that, that they would take if they were had to write a recap article about a man's life. But you spent a lot of time um, just humanizing the guy. It, it, it's that particular one can be kind of difficult because because one thing is certainly true. You know, a lot of people and a lot of people who had written things prior to that one had glossed over all of his mistakes, mm. which is also something you don't want to do because you have to be truthful about what a person was and what a person represented or else there's no point in doing it. Right. So, I mean, uh, so I guess the the goal is to be as truthful as you can while understanding the time and place you are in the world, which is this man just died. He has a family. Um, he has a memory that's not all bad. Um, it's not all good. He's a complicated person. And this is as as much as I can tell you of his complicated life right now in an honest way. And if you can do that, uh, and I hope I did that. Um, I always hope I did that. I sometimes succeed and sometimes don't. But um, I mean, that's the goal. People are complicated and it's not nearly as black and white. And so many things aren't aren't nearly as black and white as we always want to paint them. Right. You focus on corruption in politics and in business and you focus on cronyism. And I just really want to know how many people have you gotten fired? Um, way too many. I mean, seriously, uh, long before I did the column when I did, I did mainly investigative stuff. I did this piece on, um, school teachers and employees with criminal records, uh, in which it was early stages of like computer assisted reporting. And so I took a 
database of criminal records and a database of school employees and all this. And uh, it, it found like 260 people with serious records that they'd lied, I mean, you know, that they had not been honest about. And uh, so uh, we ended up weeding those down to the really serious ones. But I think 60 something people lost their jobs in that one. And that was, uh, unreal. it was horrible. I felt terrible about it, honestly. It was the hardest thing I ever did. And uh, a few of them, uh, more than one threatened to commit suicide. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I was young and I didn't know, uh, and I, it's, you know, it's not like I hadn't been into trouble when I was a kid. So, right. um, it was, uh, it was tough, but that's, uh, that's different from, uh, you know, the occasional, uh, a politician uh, that deserves it. Yeah, those are that's a different sort of situation. Those I, th- those I think you enjoy. Those I think you get a little. Well, bit well a lot of them. I mean, there. I mean, you know, there. When when powerful people do things, uh, they shouldn't do at the expense of people who trusted them. Uh, I don't have any regret over that. You, you you said that that's the hardest thing you've you've ever done. I think were your, was your words just now. Um, would that be your biggest regret as a journalist? No, I don't regret it because we ended up uh, at the end doing it in a way that I was comfortable with and that we set real high standards for what, who we were going to out. So, I mean, just because you, if you, ha- you know, it had to be a, a you know, a, a felony and, a, you know, of a certain type. I mean, you know, it had to be a real problem, not just some rinky dink, you know, drug possession or petty theft or something like that and so the people that we we ended up doing had were serial criminals or serious offenders so yeah you don't want them in your schools so yeah uh, i didn't feel too bad about it by the time it came to an end it was just a process getting us there that i hated yeah regret was the was the wrong word to choose there but uh, no it's not regrets there's got to be regrets yeah if you're not you're lying my first foray into political content i actually do regret in how i um, chose to make fun of it because I, I, I make fun of everybody. I, I make fun of Trump. I make fun of Hillary. I make fun of Bernie Sanders. I make fun of I make fun of everything. You know, sure. that's that's I'm a comedian. I'm trying to find the light in in that. I fa- I make fun of Roy Moore. I make fun of Doug Jones. I did a report from a Bernie Sanders rally when Bernie Sanders had the rally here in uh, Birmingham, and I, I interviewed a bunch of people going into the rally and made fun of socialism and made fun of hippies and and free college and all that stuff. That was fun. Once we got inside, there were a few speeches that night that were unbelievably moving, but they weren't based, they were based on feeling and they weren't based on reality. And I wanted to make fun of that, but I didn't, I didn't get that, I didn't communicate that point as well as I wanted to. For example, there was um, a, a speaker there um, that put on an unbelievable speech about struggles. And she was a, an African-American woman. She kept throwing the struggles of today back to the struggles of the civil rights era and those, those unbelievable struggles. But to me, it wasn't the same struggle because we don't have a black water fountain and a white water fountain now. So to me, it was not the same struggle. So she was evoking those feelings kind of um, not in a a factual way to me and I made fun of it but not in the right way I just made fun of the speech I didn't clarify why I was making why I why I thought the speech yes it was moving but when you take your emotions away from it and really analyze the the, the statistics I'm sorry but college loans and having gigantic amounts of debt student debt debt is not the same struggle as having you know fire hoses turned on you it's not the same struggle I didn't communicate that well I made a whole lot of people mad and I, that was the first time I've had thousands and thousands of people mad at me. I, I'm walking around like, oh my gosh, there are thousands of people that I made angry today. This is a new feeling. Welcome to the internet. You do sort of get used to that. <laughs> when you choose to have an opinion that you share publicly, there are going to be some that you... Uh, handle better than others and uh and they're all and no matter what they're going to be you are going to make people angry um and uh how i come to deal with that over the years and yeah there are takes i wish i had back there are takes that i wish i'd never made um but uh, the the standard i hold to myself is 
do I call them like I see them at the time I'm saying them? Um, and am I being honest when I do it? If you're doing, if you're having an opinion for anybody other than yourself, then you're making a mistake. If you're having an opinion because somebody else believes it, you're making a huge mistake. Um, so, I mean, if you're going to say it, you got to own it. You got to also understand that no, I could go outside and I could write that the sky is blue and half the people would think that it was the most beautiful blue they'd ever seen. And half of the people would say I'm a freaking idiot because it's obviously <laughs> not blue. I mean, no matter what I say, they're going to pe- some people are going to love it, some people are going to hate it, and that's kind of a really a humbling thing or or a I mean it's also a freeing thing cuz people are going to love it and people are going to hate it and it doesn't no matter what. So just call them like you see them. As for the humor, you know, that's where I really worry about the world because, you know, we mm. do have to be able to laugh and we have to be able to point out absurdities without people taking it as a personal attack. The, the, the sort of the quality of our discourse has seemingly dropped off the face of the planet in the last few years. I don't blame that all on Trump. I mean, I think that, the, as we've said, the nature of the Internet is such that it has, has, done, has caused that among all of us. But, I mean, to read my email, I can tell you that the country is or or the readership is uh, certainly a lot more willing to say things that are either uh, combative or how do you put it uh, insulting or uh, just obscene or racist or whatever uh, now than they were when I started doing this and uh, and for whatever reason Uh, I can tell you pardon my French that uh, any email that starts off your f-ing idiot, I will not respond to. That's my rule. <laughs> so that won't get a response. Right. You're just, you're I mean, out. I try to respond to my email, but if you're just going to call me names first, I just don't really think that I would need to do that. So, right. you know, I've, that's a decision I've made right now, lately. I'm sticking to it. Somebody that does a great job of speaking to people of all walks of life uh, and that's in public office is our current mayor. And I think that's a large part of why he got elected. He had so much support from all different kinds of people. And it seems like he's doing a great job to continue to raise the bar uh, for Birmingham. But I I don't know. This is just, this is just what I see from the outside. I I don't know anything about anything, but he seems to be somebody that's uh, continuing to help Birmingham get on the right track. Yeah, I mean, and again, we say the bar's kind of low, but uh, he uh, he does seem to uh, have a way of, uh, well, first of all, he's also using that sort of Trumpian method of using social media to get his story across in his own way. And I think that because he's young and he's good with Twitter and he can... Uh, he can make a joke or tweet to cookout restaurant that he wants me to come or something like that, that he kind of has a voice that we've never seen in that office before. And I think that's really helping him. Um, uh, you know, obviously the jury's still out on how the city runs, uh, uh, but uh, looks pretty good so far. So what is good about the direction that Birmingham is heading and what is bad and what needs to be fixed? Well, you know, I mean, for, for people who uh, are new to Birmingham or not, I mean, that, it's really hard for them to understand just how bleak things seemed a decade ago. Um, there, It was hopeless and there was nothing downtown. And uh, it seemed like this city was sort of dying. And somehow or other, beginning with the the... It still stuns me to say this, but beginning with the sort of birth of Railroad Park and the development that took place around it and the rebirth of Avondale and um, this idea that Birmingham could be this gastronomical sort of hub uh, and really sort of took off. I mean, that breathed a whole lot of life in in this town, if only only from an entertainment sort of perspective. And all of a sudden it became, uh, you know, a little bit more hip and a little bit more active and 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 all of those things are small things in terms of the grand scheme of things because we still have trouble recruiting large industry and we still have uh, an incredible crime problem that uh, has always, I mean, it's not new. This is something that in Birmingham since the 30s has always been in the top, 
you know, we've always been a murder capital of the South per capita, of the world, of the nation per capita. So um, we still have those issues, uh, but we have an optimism we did not have before, which is not, not to be taken for granted because that was gone for a long time. And as somebody who grew up in this town, um, that alone uh, uh, is really, really a positive thing. Um, we are, and you know, with UAB, for, with the support for UAB and the stadium downtown, um, I mean, that's good. We still have to work on jobs and the economy and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, I lived downtown before Railroad Park, before, um, before that rebirth, and it was bleak. It was like Alabama Theater. That's the only place in this area. And Speakeasy, the bar across the street. <laughs> like Those were the only places I would ever go on the north side, ever. You know, it was strange to see when Railroad Park was built, and there were a few, and we've had a few incidences of crime, uh, there, but most of the time it's it's a wonderful, beautiful place to hang out and go. I go there all the time. I love Railroad Park. But it was strange to see people almost pointing to those small number of incidents as a C. See, I told, oh yeah, we shouldn't have spent the money on that park. See, Birmingham, it really there's there's we can't save Birmingham. That kind of thing. It was strange to see that from so many people, and. Um, puzzled me. I was like, are, are you taking joy? Because the, the better that the hub of downtown Birmingham does, I know you live in, in wherever, Mountain Brook, Homewood, Tarrant, wherever you might live, the better that the hub, to me at least, and I, I don't know anything, but to me, the better that the hub of downtown Birmingham does, the better everybody does. To, to quote the capitalist thing, um, trickle down. It, it trickles out. Success trickles out. That's more jobs, that's more infrastructure, that's more attraction on a national scale. But maybe they wanted to keep things small. I don't. I don't know. The fact of the matter is that crime is a spectator sport in this town, um, and you're right that a lot of people. We have. I mean, we have. I mean, think about it. And this is a, the largest metro area in the state by far. Um, we have 35 municipalities in this one county, um, and you know Birmingham is the center of it. I mean, and, and so it, in most communities this size the city would be much larger and would include a lot of those areas. So uh, its per capita crime rate would be by fair nature smaller. So we, uh, because we're so divided like this and we have this setup, it, it artificially makes our horrible crime seem that much more horrible. Mm. But over the course of time, you know, I mean, people who've lived here a long time and watched this stuff. I mean, there was in the early 80s, late 70s, 80s, early 80s, it was this huge push downtown to revitalize Mar Morris Avenue and they had nightclubs and bars and it was going to be like underground Atlanta and it was a big deal and people were going there. It was all hot. And then there was a murder there like in 80, 81. And it just killed it dead. And so a lot of people who who grew up then say, you know, the same thing's going to happen. The same thing's going to happen. And I was probably one of them saying that. I mean, I've had to say, we talked about regrets. I had to say I was wrong about Railroad Park because mm. um, I told, uh, uh, you know, I, I wrote about that then. But, um, you know, when there was that first shooting there, it was like everybody held their breath and said, it's yeah. going to be over, right? Yeah, right. But it wasn't. And that's one of the sort of remarkable things, and that was one of the biggest differences there than in, in some of these other places we had seen, is that people gave it a second chance. There's a, there's a guy at the library, I mean, I, Jim Baggett, historian, great historian at the library, who I used to, I remember asking him one time, what's going to happen, what's going to have to happen for us to to get out of this funk in this town for us to move forward. And he said, well, the right people have to die. Mm. And, uh, and, you know, I thought, well, you know, that's kind of harsh at the time, but, uh, but I came to sort of believe that. And when I look at what happens to the city now, I mean, I think maybe that's the case. Maybe the right people died or the right people sort of moved in. And this younger generation had the courage to make something out of, uh, out of, uh, out of Birmingham that older people had already given up on and moved, moved away. So, I mean, I think a lot of it is youth and, and, and this whole adventurous spirit. Um, and maybe the right people died. Um, <clears throat> quick disclaimer, uh, John, John Archibald doesn't want anyone to die. Just, uh, <laughs> just a quick disclaimer about that. I love Birmingham. 
for so many reasons. It's got so many of the good things that a big city has without a whole lot of the negative things that big cities have. Um, so I, I believe in Birmingham and um, I think it's got a bright future. I, I plan on staying here uh, for a really long time and raising a family in this city. So I, I'm, I'm loving seeing the, the progress that we're, we're going through. How familiar are you with the Rick and Bubba show? I mean, uh, it's been on my, all my career. Uh, my favorite part about Rick and Bubba is the humor. And the more humor, the the better, as far as I, I'm concerned. If, I, if you're asking me personally what I like and what I don't like, um, I, I don't, I'm not a person who wears religion on my sleeve and I don't always want to mix it with my entertainment in the morning. And so I would, I would say, uh, give me more humor and less uh, of your own personal theology. About theology, I do understand and I appreciate and I respect that Rick and Bubba do, do the humor thing with the goal of spiking in little pieces of that theology in order, because that, that's the ultimate goal. Because when, when it comes to eternal ram, ramifications, they know uh, what, what matters to them. Mm -hmm. And they want to. No doubt. That's the, that is the ultimate goal. And obviously they're good at what they do because they have a huge audience. Um, um, and I don't have any quibbles with Rick and Bubba. But they've been good to me even when, I, you know, we had some uncomfortable moments. For sure. Yeah. I'll uh, go ahead and move on uh, from that because it's, it's still a tough thing. You know, it's, it's, it's a complicated, tough, tough thing. It is. I mean, you know, the thing about it is, you know, Rick and I disagree both theologically and uh, otherwise about some of those things. But I, I do feel strongly that my beliefs should not interfere with your beliefs. Uh, and, and that's the whole philosophy of what I am and what I do, is that we all get to believe as we believe. And so, uh, you know, it is real easy for me to sit down with somebody who disagrees with me. Uh, I think I think we ought to do it more. Plus, you guys were able to sit down and find probably a lot more common ground than anybody would uh, would imagine. And well, R Rick Burgess and I are essentially raised exactly the same way I was in exactly say, the same place. I was going to say the ex I was going to say the exact same thing. You guys, I mean, I, I I'm going to put a picture on the screen right now where they both are rocking the same mullet. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, Oxford, Alabama, isn't that far from Alabaster, Alabama? Yeah. You know, I mean, that you guys are. Homebred Alabama boys. It is amazing to see how similar you guys got brought up and the different paths that you took to become two titans of of what you do in the state of Alabama. I'm gonna ask you some quick rapid fire questions. We can wrap this thing up as we sit here at Sloss Furnaces. Uh, I'm getting a little cold and I'm freezing my uh, butt off. Are here. you freezing? Okay. All right. We could, we could embrace for warmth during this section or we're, we can just make it We're in the quick. love shack, but let's not. Okay. We'll just make it quick then. Uh, what's your favorite book? To Kill a Mockingbird. Favorite news outlet? Oh, well, I'm a, the Alabama Media Group, AL.com, but that's not fair, is it? I have a complete menu, so man, I'm going to say Twitter because I've ha mm. I have made it uh, a menu of people I trust. Who's your favorite journalist? A guy, a columnist by the name of Steve, Steve Lopez, works for the Los Angeles Times. He used to be at the Philadelphia Inquirer. The only reason I ever wanted to be a columnist was reading him. And it was really ironic last year when he was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, and I felt really guilty about it because he's the best ever. Wow. Um, any advice, any quick advice for someone that's uh, maybe a student, somebody that age that's wanting to get into journalism? Yeah, they're going to tell you not to do it. They're going to tell you it's a death sentence. They're going to tell you it's all dying and we need you more than ever. Uh, we're going to need strong, creative people to do creative things in ways we never thought to do them. So just, uh, you know, just know what you're getting into, but get into it. Who's your favorite songwriter? Todd Schneider. Nice. Uh, what is your favorite local food? My favorite local food is, wow, that's hard. <laughs> uh, can I come back to that? Favorite local drink, then we'll come back to food. Oh, man. Sorry. All I drink is tequila shots, so, you know, okay. anybody can do that for me. I mean, not when I drink. <laughs> sure. It's not all I drink. I also have water. Good, good, you good. Know. That's healthy. That's yeah. healthy for you. 
Uh, you got a local food, or you want to skip that one? Um, well, you know, I've been, I'm, I'm really, I'm really sort of partial to the standard burger at uh, down in Possess because they make mm-hmm. a mean burger, and they changed my whole philosophy of food because I thought that people who put made put pimento cheese on hot things were uh, horrible people until I <laughs> ate the until I ate the pimento cheese on their burger. Okay, we're actually going to head to the, uh, Josh. Thank you so much for your help, Josh Odom. Uh, thank you, thank Josh. you so much for your help. I usually usually this is a one man show, but this one was important today, so I wanted to bring somebody with me uh, so we could just sit and chat, and I didn't have to think as much about as are my cameras rolling. Uh, that being said, I did forget a camera today, but that was not your fault, Josh. Uh, do you play last last couple of quick questions, and we're out of here. Do you play music, sports, hunt, or fish, or have any other hobbies besides blacksmithing? I play basketball with a group of old guys every Saturday for years and years on end it's probably the most important thing i do outside of work and uh uh i can't do anything musical it's talk about a regret i feel like i should have been able to do that but i can't so blacksmithing and getting rich and powerful people fired and or sent to prison those seem to be your hobbies and i hope that you keep both of them up and thank you for uh you know, thank you for pe- keeping powerful people accountable because that is that's the only way that this whole capitalism thing works. So thank you for sitting down and talking to me, and uh, um, I'll be looking out for your, uh, your your all your articles in the future. And congratulations on the stinking Pulitzer Prize, my gosh! Thanks, man. I appreciate it. It was fun. That's it for today's episode. Thank you so much for checking it out. At the end of every episode, I like to highlight a different nonprofit organization. And today it's King's Home. King's Home is the result of King's Ranch and Hannah Home uniting under one purpose to provide Christ centered homes and services for at risk youth, women and mothers with children. King's Home teaches skills and provides services to help their residents heal from their devastating pasts, break the cycle of abuse and become independent, productive members of the community. They have over 20 residential group homes across four counties serving 400 residents a year to help out you can donate goods and you can donate funds and you can volunteer and you can shop at the newly opened king's home thrift store find more info at kingshome.com next week my guest will be brandon mccaffron he's the head instructor at 10th planet jiu-jitsu mixed martial arts and kickboxing school in decatur alabama he also trains a couple ufc fighters and his wife is a jiu-jitsu brown belt so it should be a great episode His wife can definitely beat me up. Please do like, comment, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts and on YouTube or wherever you may be catching this show. It really helps and really makes a big difference to hear from you, the viewers, and the listeners. Thank you so much for watching and for listening. I will see you next week. I did forget one of my regrets that I wanted to mention. We all have gaps in our knowledge. I have many, many gaps. I was on the radio one time interviewing a uh, the lead singer from the Whalers, as in Bob Marley and the Whalers. He was the, now the new lead singer. Interviewing him, we were talking about social injustices. I had never heard the word apartheid out loud, and I said apartheid. I said apartheid on the radio, and I my phone blows up, my email blows up. It's like, you apartheid, you idiot. <laughs>